Welcome, everybody. We're going to start the webinar for the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. We have people from all over the country. So those of you who are on Pacific Coast time zone, thank you for getting up at 7 o'clock in the morning to do that. And we're really grateful that you're all here. My name is Karen Oberhauser, and I'd like to start this webinar with a recognition that Arboretum land is the ancestral home of the Ho-Chunk people. We acknowledge the circumstances that led to their forced removal and honor the Ho-Chunk Nation's history of resistance and resilience. All right, now we're going to get started. And I would like to first introduce um, all of the people who are here as panelists and behind the screen making this happen. This is our first big webinar um, that we put on at the Arboretum under COVID restrictions. So we're used to doing things in person and we all wish that you, we were with you in person today. So I'm actually going to put on my field hat and pretend that we're doing this workshop out in the field. But we have a lot of people here that are helping out. Um, and I'm going to start in alphabetical order with Katie Lynn Bunny, who is the education coordinator of the Monarch Joint Venture. And she'll be answering some of your questions today. Susan Day is the Arboretum Communications Coordinator. And she has done all of the work setting up this webinar. We've practiced about four times during the week. So hopefully everything will go. Brad Herrick is our Arboretum Research Program Manager, and he'll be fielding questions as well. And I'm the director of the Arboretum and also the chair of the steering committee of the Monarch Joint Venture. So this, this webinar is jointly run by the Arboretum and the Monarch Joint Venture, as is the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. So just a few WebEx hints. Um, I'm sure a lot of you have never used WebEx before, or maybe you've been doing it a lot in the last three months. But it, all of your screens are going to look a little different, but just to explain a bit, if you toggle over the left side of your screen, you should see a vertical bar. And that, that bar um, will let you do a lot of things. You can experiment, but one thing that's kind of useful is you can zoom in and out of the slide if you push the little um, hand lens or the little micro or the um, magnifying glass uh, icons there. And in the middle, you should see the slides, and that's what I'm seeing on my screen. And then over on the right, you'll see a question and answer box. So if questions come up for you during the webinar, please ask them as they come up and some will be answered right away and some will be saved for Q&A sessions. And at a few times during the webinar, we'll have some polls where we'll ask you questions. It'll be like little quizzes to test your knowledge of what you're learning. So that'll be pretty self-evident when they come up. So please, as soon as a question comes up, um, if we were in person, which I really wish we were, and I could just look out at you in an audience, and then we'd go out in the field after we had a little introduction. But if we were in the field or in a, in a room together, I would want you to ask me questions as soon as they come into your head. So I'm not going to be able to answer them all because we have a lot of people here, but you should type them in the Q&A box and make sure that you send your questions to all panelists. So you'll have a choice for sending them to all panelists. And some of them will be answered directly by Katie Lynn. Some will be asked during the question breaks by Brad. And some, we, if we just don't have time to get to all of them, we'll save them and send all of you a follow-up document that has answers to your questions. So we really value your questions and hope that you ask them right away as soon as, as, soon as you think of them. And if you're having technical difficulties, you can put those into the question and answer box as well, and Susan Day will answer them. So that's a little bit of background. And now I want to talk a little bit about you. So we asked you a few questions when you signed up for the webinar today. Like I said before, you're from all over the country. You're in three different time or four different time zones. You have um, varied backgrounds and experience. So no matter what your experience is with monarchs or citizen science, you're not alone. 61% of you 
have some experience with monarchs, raising them or studying them or watching them closely. And 42% of you have experience with citizen science. So this picture here is just to kind of remind us that everyone is coming to this from a lot of different backgrounds and we hope that you all get something out of it. We also asked you what citizen science programs you've done and you represent a lot of different Monarch Citizen Science programs. For those of you that are new to Monarch Citizen Science, you can just look at this list and see all of the possibilities. A lot of you have participated in Journey North, Monarch Watch, Tagging. A few have already done the MLMP and then lots of other programs that you've been involved with. But what I was really excited about was seeing all the different programs, and this is just a, a short sampling of the list of the different citizen science programs that you've done. So lots of you monitor birds and streams. Coco Raz is a great project that measures precipitation. Um, bees, you're doing a lot of things. And my favorite one, there was one person, so I hope this person is here because um, you really made me smile. I, I actually looked this program up on the web, the Northern Red Bellies Cooter Head Start Program. So this is a program that helps little tiny turtles. So that was a great one. So many, many different ways you can participate in citizen science and thanks for all that you're already doing. So a little, we're gonna move into Monarchs right now. Um, just like you are all from all over the country, Monarchs, are in pretty much every state of the union except Alaska, and they might get. Monarchs are the state insect or butterfly of seven different states. So that means that more than 10% of the states in our union have chosen monarchs as their state insect or butterfly. And this is our proclamation from Minnesota when monarchs were named the state butterfly in 1998. So you can read that. So if your state is not listed over here on the left, it might be kind of fun for you to figure out what your state insect or butterfly is. Some Karen? Yeah? Karen, I need to interrupt you for a moment. We seem to be having um, some sound issues. Some people are not hearing things. Okay. So I'm gonna ask you to pause. Okay. Um, and we will try to figure out what's going on. I'm not muted. Okay, it sounds like it's working fine for some people. Um, and it seems to be improving. So I think maybe people need to check their sound settings. Um, and there, there are a lot of um, there are a lot of comments coming in. I'm going to save some of these, make them public, but I think it might be um, on the user end. So why don't you go ahead and we'll try to resolve it behind the scenes. Okay. Okay. So thank you um, for asking. Thanks for stopping me. So yeah, we've, we've worked out that if anything's going wrong, Susan is just gonna interrupt. So thanks for saying whatever your problems are and hopefully we'll get them worked out. So um, I was saying that you should figure out what your state insect or butterfly is. And if you're from Wisconsin, which a lot of you are, um, you, our state insect is an interesting one. It's the honeybee. And hopefully some people are thinking the honeybee is a little bit of an odd one to have for a state insect because it actually is not a native insect, but it's, it's clearly a really important insect in Wisconsin and a lot of other states. So that's our state insect in Wisconsin. So that can be your little assignment to figure out what your state butterfly or insect is. All right, so now we're going to dive right into Monarch Biology um, 101, just a little background on monarchs, and then we'll move over to the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project after that. And remember that you will have time to ask questions. So in about 20 minutes, we're going to break for questions. Um, Katie Lynn will be answering your questions in the Q&A box, and then we'll save some for 930. Okay, so we're going to start out with the monarch life cycle. 
Uh, most monarchs start their lives in a field like this one, a uh, field with a lot of milkweed in it. The eggs are laid singly, I mean, one at a time, usually on the bottom of milkweed leaves, and they're an egg for about four to five days. And then they're a caterpillar for anywhere from nine to 12 days or even longer if it's cool. And they go through five larval instars, which are all illustrated in this picture right here. And if you look way on the top right up here is an egg. The egg is about the size of a pinhead. And then the next stage is the pupa or chrysalis. And under the same temperature conditions, they're a chrysalis for about one day less than their larva. So that stage goes a little bit faster. And that's when the metamorphosis is completed and the adult butterfly emerges. And that lives two to six weeks in the summer. So if you're seeing monarchs right now, those monarchs will live two to six weeks on average about a month. And then the ones that migrate will live eight to 10 months because they'll spend the whole winter in Mexico and then come back. So that's the life cycle of an individual monarch. And let's talk a little bit about these stages. The females only lay eggs on milkweed plants. So here you can see a female laying eggs or ovipositing. So she's bending her abdomen around and depositing one egg. And the top right picture on the right is um, one egg that's about ready to hatch. So you can see its little black head chewing its way out of the eggshell or the chorion. And I said that they usually lay eggs singly, but you will sometimes find multiple eggs. So on this milkweed leaf, there are actually seven. There's one egg way down here. So probably different females came or one female who was kind of at the end of her life and didn't think she was going to be able to fly a lot further. But a strong, healthy female will usually lay eggs just one at a time. There are over 100 milkweed species that are native to North America, and monarch caterpillars will eat most of them. So this isn't a milkweed identification seminar, um, but milkweed is such a cool plant. It's a cool genus of plants. But I'm just going to point out the ones that are pictured on here. And I'm going to start with the one in the top middle, which is Asclepias verticillata, or world. Milkweed is fairly common in the upper Midwest, a beautiful little plant. Then we have common milkweed that's very common. This is swamp milkweed or Asclepias incarnata, butterfly weed, Asclepias tuberosa. So this one, um, these two are, are really common in the Eastern United States, kind of Northeastern. Um, this one covers a big range. This is, this is common. It might be one of the most widespread milkweeds, I'm not sure. Um, butterfly weed. This is a very fun milkweed. This one lives in Arizona. It's Asclepia subulata or desert milkweed. Um, and what's cool about this one is it doesn't have leaves and the caterpillars actually just chew the stems on this one. So it's a great one to find. I, I love seeing it when I'm in Arizona. This is green milkweed, Asclepias viridis. And this is a Western milkweed. It, it actually comes as far over as kind of Western Minnesota, I've never seen it in Wisconsin, micro somewhere here, but this is showy milkweed up here and it's really closely related to common milkweed. So a lot of variety in the flowers, but the flowers all have the same basic morphology. And here we have the two adults. Um, I'm gonna give you a second before I tell you which one is a male or a female. So right now I would be saying, which one is the male? And somebody would be telling me, which one it was, so kind of look at them for a second, see if you know that. And then I'm going to tell you that the one on the right is the male, and we can tell that because he has these little spots on his hind wings, which are specialized scales that um, in a lot of close relatives of monarchs, uh, they emit a pheromone that attracts the females. So they're specialized scales that are kind of like little tubes that can, can emit a pheromone. So here's the male and the female. And you will often see mating pairs. So if you're out looking for monarchs, uh, it's fairly common to see them mating. Both sexes mate multiple, multiple times in their lives and they stay together for a long time. So there's a good chance that you will see them mating and you'll often see them flying. And if they're flying, it's the male that's doing the flying and the female that's hanging down underneath the male when they're flying and then they'll find a nice quiet place to finish mating, but they'll be together for several hours. They'll start anytime during the day and then stay together for most of the night. So it's a long, long process. And that's what I studied for my PhD. So 
um, I'm pretty interested in monarch mating. Okay, so the adults eat lots and lots of kinds of nectar. They eat nectar from many flowers. So if you're doing conservation for monarchs, if you're creating monarch habitat, you want to have flowers available for them throughout the season. So all of the flowers in here on this picture are native except for one. And this is the lilac. And I put this in on purpose because sometimes in the spring when monarchs come back, there aren't a lot of native flowers available to them. So lilac is actually a good host plant. And then we go through the summer. Um, we have the um, echinacea right here, the coneflower, bee balm. This is Joe pie weed right here. You can see there's quite a few monarchs on that. They really like that. Um, Black-eyed Susan, uh, New England aster, and a uh, blazing star. So this kind of represents the season of nectar for monarchs and, and they'll, they need nectar because they're relatively long lived. So they need nectar to fuel their activities as adults. Um, okay, so a few things that once you, um, once people know that you like monarchs, they're gonna, ask you a lot of questions and you'll be your neighborhood expert on monarchs. And I know that some of you already are, but here's a really common question that monarch people get a lot. Um, you'll get somebody calling you and saying, there is a monarch caterpillar eating my parsley or my dill or my carrots. And you'll always know that that's not a monarch. They don't eat those things. And if you look at this, it really doesn't look like a monarch caterpillar. It's got green on it, which monarchs don't. But a lot of people think that all striped caterpillars are monarchs. So this is a black swallowtail to raise. So if you do have them eating your parsley in your back in your backyard, I'd recommend bringing some in and raising them. I, I just love rearing caterpillars. So this is a fun one. And another thing is people are going to tell you they're seeing thousands of monarchs in their yard. And it's a good thing to remember that not all orange and black butterflies are monarchs. So this picture is a painted lady butterfly. And every once in a while, we do get thousands. These move back into the upper Midwest from the south. They don't overwinter here as far as we know. But um, some years you will see thousands of them in your gardens. And um, so if people tell you, I've had people tell me that they're seeing a lot of baby monarchs because these are smaller than monarchs. So it's, it's gonna be a painted lady. Um, there's American lady. There are lots of orange and black butterflies and only one of them is monarchs. So now we're gonna have a little quiz for you. These, these are a little harder, these three butterflies. So you, I'm gonna give you about 10 seconds to say which one is the monarch. And you should see a, a poll up on your screen and you just click one, two, or three for which one is the monarch. So I'm gonna count down now from 10 and give you that much time. 10, nine, eight, seven, six, five, four, three, Two, one. Okay, so now Susan is going to share the results. I don't see them, Susan. There are still a lot in progress. Oh, okay, we'll give you a little more time, but you shouldn't be looking it up online. <laughs> so you can tell me, you can decide, Susan, when to close it. They all look a lot like monarchs. And I will tell you which is which. One of these, if you're in the northern part of the country, you wouldn't, wouldn't see. If you're in the south, you would see all three of these species.
Okay, maybe we should move move in. So I'm not seeing the results, Susan. Oh, there we go. Okay. Oh, great. Um, so can everybody see the results now, Susan? Okay. I think so. Okay. So we have um, 31 of you didn't answer, but 86 of you said, so um, most of you said that number three is the monarch. And here, I'm just gonna click up onto the answers here. So you're, most of you are right that number three is the monarch, but two looks a lot like a monarch. And two is a viceroy, it's a monarch mimic. So monarchs are toxic because they eat milkweed and birds don't like to eat them. So viceroys have evolved to look a lot like monarchs. But you can always tell a viceroy, it's size, they're on average a little bit smaller than monarchs, but there's a lot of overlap in their size. But if you look at this line, on the oopsie. If you look at this line on this butterfly, that makes it a viceroy, and the monarch does not have that line. So that's in a completely different genus, Limonitis archippus, the viceroy, and the queen is very closely related to monarchs. And what's interesting in the southern part of the country where queens are more common, viceroys will actually mimic queens. So viceroys um, evolve to mimic the butterfly that's most common, the toxic butterfly that's most common in their area. There's been some really interesting work on that. And here are the pictures of the caterpillars of those two species. You can see the viceroy caterpillar looks nothing like a monarch. Um, it's actually really hard to find. I've only raised a couple of these in my life. They eat willow leaves and they curl up the willow leaf around their body. So you can't you can't really find them easily. You almost have to watch a female laying the eggs. And then here's the queen. But she has this extra pair of tentacles in the middle of the body right there. So it looks like a monarch, kind of. But the monarch doesn't have these tentacles, except every once in a while you do find a monarch, like one out of several thousand. So I have seen that, but it's rare. So these are the lookalikes. And you would be excused for thinking these were monarchs. Okay, so now we're going to move into thinking about the annual cycle. So we've talked about the individual life cycle of egg, caterpillar, pupa, and adult, but now we're going to talk about the migratory cycle. And we're going to start in the fall with monarchs migrating south. So these are monarchs, this, this kind of represents August and September and October, this map. So this is showing you the monarchs leaving their breeding range and moving down through Texas, getting to overwintering sites in Mexico. Some of them probably miss this turn to the west and end up in southern Florida where they join a continuously breeding population. And monarchs that are west of the Rocky Mountains, for the most part, migrate to sites along the coast of California. But there is some overlap between these populations with monarchs from Arizona and probably other states joining the monarchs from the east in Mexico. So these monarchs are flying south for a couple months starting in about mid-August. They get to the overwintering sites in Mexico, stay there, arrive there in early November, stay there all winter, and then those very same butterflies start the journey north, and the butterflies that overwintered in Mexico make it into about the southern quarter of the country. Those from California pretty much repopulate their whole breeding range, and then it's the next generation of monarchs in the east that gets all the way back to their summer breeding ground. So it's a two generation return trip. And then they go through two to three non-migratory generations and then the cycle starts again. So they migrate south, they overwinter, they migrate north and they breed. And we know because monarchs are in these same spots for the winter time, we can gauge the size of the population because most of the monarchs are concentrated in these sites together. And we can look at how big the population, and I'll talk a little bit more about that for the Eastern population in a couple minutes. And if we think about this cycle in pictures and what monarchs need is they're migrating south, they need nectar plants, they need safe places to roost because they don't fly at nighttime. So this picture of the butterflies flying into the tree is a mesquite tree, this was taken in Texas, 
And so they fly down, they stop at night. And when there gets to be a lot of them, you'll see multiple butterflies and trees. They get to Mexico and basically for the most part in Mexico, they just hang out in the trees but some of them do fly up into the air. So you get these big flights of monarchs when the sun hits them, especially later, um, just before they're ready to leave. So it's amazing. This is a fun fact for you that the concentration of monarchs in Mexico is the second largest concentration of animals in the world. And the largest one is krill in the Antarctic Ocean. So this is an amazing phenomenon. Then as the monarchs leave, they start moving north. Again, they need nectar on the way, so I put my lilac picture back in there. And they're basically moving north with milkweed. So this butterfly has found a little green milkweed plant. This picture is in Oklahoma. And she's just finding, she's basically finding milkweed plants as they're just starting to come up. Then they get back up here into the upper Midwest and go through those two, two of the three generations, laying eggs on milkweed, caterpillars growing, um, and eating nectar. So this is a, a chain, it's a cycle. And we need every link in this chain in order for it to survive. But the way that I like to think of this, and I, whenever I go to Mexico and see all these butterflies hanging in the trees, I tend to look at these individual butterflies and think each one of them has a really amazing story to tell, a story of survival. Because a lot has to go right in order for that monarch to make it. And every one of those survival stories started on a milkweed plant, and most of those milkweed plants are in the upper Midwest. Of course, there are monarchs in a lot of other places, but we know that most years, the majority of the monarchs come from the upper Midwest or the Corn Belt. So that's where the story starts. That's kind of the basis of this chain. Now, one of the reasons that we know so much about monarchs is they're just one of a million species of insects, probably more, but we really do know a lot about them. And that's because they're so intensively monitored. So this, to really look at the different names on here. The point is, this is just a long list of programs. And these programs are monitoring every stage of this annual cycle. So we're gonna be focusing on one of these programs today but I just want you to realize that there are many, many ways to get involved with studying monarchs. So we are gonna be focusing on the Monarch Larval Monitoring Project, but that's just one of many. And I wanted to list for you what I consider the big five Monarch Citizen Science Projects. This doesn't mean they're the most important ones because we learn from all of them, but these are the ones that are the longest term and have the biggest spatial scale. So we've learned a lot from the North American Butterfly Association. This isn't a monarch monitoring program, but they count all butterflies. So we use the monarch data from this to understand a lot with what's going on with adult monarchs. So you can see this started in 1975. I'm not gonna read the extent of all these, but you can see there's lots and lots of reports in all these programs. Monarch Watch, a tagging program, started in 92, Journey North, which I'll talk about a little bit very briefly here. Started in 94, the one we're talking about today, the MLMP started in 96, and then Monarch Health started in 2006. So these are the ones that cover big spatial scales and that we really learn a lot about the whole population from. So you can um, go back and look at some of these if you'd like to. And I know that a lot of you are already doing them. So this is just one of those. This is Journey North, um, started in 90. And this one, so this is a picture of the spring sightings. This program is also housed at the UW Arboretum. And each one of the dots on this map represents somebody's first sighting of a monarch. So you can see we can track the monarchs as they move north and see whenever you're missing monarchs, if you live up in Wisconsin, they don't get here till May, but you can see where they are by logging on to journeynorth.org. And if you're missing seeing monarchs, you can click on one of these dots that have a, a black or a white square in them, and you can see a picture. So here's a picture that was taken this spring by somebody named Carol in New York. So this is a way that you can see the monarchs as they're moving north. 
Okay, and I'm just going to briefly talk about monarch conservation here before we break for questions. Um, monarch numbers are declining. I said that in Mexico, we measure, we can measure them because they're all together. And what we do in Mexico is we measure the area that's occupied by monarchs. So this is hectares of monarchs, area covered by trees, covered with monarchs. And I don't usually get too excited about any one year of data because you can see there's a lot of up and down here. But what I like to do is look at decade means. So this is what we had in Mexico last winter. This was the winter before. So these are the start year. There's a lot of up and down, but if we look at the last decade, it's been an average of 2.82, which is basically almost exactly what we had last year. We got very excited about this point, which was six hectares in the winter of 2018, 2019, but that was actually would have just been an average year in the decade before this, in the beginning of the 2000s. And here's what it was from the time that the measurement started up until 1999. So you can see that monarch numbers are declining over time with a lot of ups and downs. And what we know is that breeding habitat loss and hot weather are associated with lower monarch populations. I'm gonna focus here, ending this on breeding habitat loss, but clearly, um, climate change models um, predict more hot weather. And what we need to do about that is just make sure we try to mitigate climate change, but make sure there's a lot of habitat available because monarchs can move from one place to another. So if it's really hot somewhere, they can go somewhere else if there's a lot of habitat available to them. But we're going to think about where we could put habitat for monarchs. So if you have control over any of these kinds of spaces, you can put in monarch habitat. Um, we can put monarchs in urban and suburban spaces. This used to be my yard. When I lived in Minnesota, I got a lot of monarchs in my yard. So you can do that in your front yards or your backyards, but unfortunately, this is what a lot of yards look like. So that's something we can change. We, there's a, a potential for habitat in that picture. This is in Kalamazoo, Michigan. We can make sure that agricultural set-aside land is appropriate for monarchs. This is a prairie strip, corn growing there, and there's the habitat next to it. And this is actually getting to be a pretty big program in Iowa. This was about a year ago that I took this article out of a newspaper, but these are strips of habitat in a soybean field. And there are a lot of benefits to this in terms of erosion control and water quality, but definitely one is habitat. Rights of ways are another good possibility. So this is a roadside in Minnesota, but um, rights of ways can include utility rights of ways or railroad rights of ways, just linear habitats that can be restored to help monarchs and a lot of other species. We have to make sure with these road sides that we're not counting on the area that might get mowed. So in a lot of cases, the area, like you can see in this top picture along an interstate is not habitat because that has to be mowed for safety. And you can put the habitat back off of this area that's right next to the road. Protected lands are another option. So wherever we have land that's protected, if it's a state or national forest or a county forest, that can be monarch habitat. And then there's marginal agricultural land. So this is land that is farmed. It's not in a set aside program, but it probably should be because in most years, the land isn't good. And it, you saw this in Wisconsin last year, we're seeing it in some fields right now in Wisconsin, a lot of fields get flooded in the beginning and this cornfield is not going to come back this year. So it's, it's a loss. And this is land that could be taken out of production and put into natural habitat. So for me, um, people ask me a lot, do I have hope with what's going on with monarch numbers? And this is one of the reasons that I have hope is that there are all of these organizations at an international level in all of the countries of North, North America, different programs that are working on protecting monarchs. And I'm gonna talk just very briefly about the Monarch Joint Venture, which is a partnership of right now over 90 organizations that work in the US. And I'm proud to say that our Arboretum is part of the Monarch Joint Venture. But here are 
all of the other organism organizations. So I wish that I could give you a lot of time to stare at this because it's such a hopeful and happy slide. Um, these are organizations that have joined the Monarch Joint Venture as partners and are collaborating on Monarch conservation. So maybe you'll see your organization on this beautiful display of logos. And here are some that I'm associated with. Um, the Arboretum is a member, the Monarch Butterfly Fund, and Journey North. So these are, these are my organizations. So we're going to end um, here. What can you do? Um, you can create habitat. Do all you can. You can contribute to Monarch Citizen Science, and you're going to learn how to do that in a couple minutes. You can support conservation organizations that are saving habitat. And then after today, you're going to be a monarch expert, or maybe you already are a monarch expert. So spread the word and talk to people about monarch conservation and what they can do. So here are the four big things you can do. Now I am going to take a break and um, see what questions have come in. All right, Karen, we have a couple of questions um, that are pretty broad that I think maybe people would be interested in hearing about. Uh, just second here. Okay, um, here's one question. Um, I am monitoring for MLMP on Long Island, New York. I haven't been finding a lot of eggs or larvae yet, or even seeing many adults. I was wondering if this has been common in other areas and if maybe it has something to do with the low overwintering population. Yeah, that is a really great question. And I'm actually going to show you some graphs that this year the monarch numbers that we're seeing with the MLMP are lower than they were last year. And sometimes in New York, you actually get your monarchs come a little bit later because they actually have to travel farther. Um, you know, to get to Wisconsin from Mexico that you just go straight up, but to get to New York, you have to go quite a ways east. So your monarchs generally come a lot later, but I would not be surprised if you'll be seeing lower numbers. But I want to make a really strong point here that it's really important that we monitor when we're seeing low numbers because we need to know numbers. So thank you for monitoring, even though the numbers are low. question all right and then another question just came in what is your feeling about solar farms that say they are creating pollinator gardens under their solar collectors yeah so that's a great question and i was involved with um promoting that when i was at the university of minnesota with my colleague marla Spivak, who's a bee conservation biologist i think it's great i mean i think that it's a win-win situation because Solar energy really does save a lot of carbon footprint. So, the, so we have the solar panels there that are decreasing the amount of carbon dioxide emissions going into the atmosphere, which is going to help monarchs and a lot of other species in one way. But then some of the solar farms are really big and there is a lot of potential for land there. So that's something that's um, really taking off, putting pollinator habitat in solar solar area or areas um, not right under the solar panels but between them and on the edges so I think it's a great possibility um, for a kind of a win-win um, many many good environmental benefits from that all right uh, a couple more questions here that are just coming in why is attempting to increase the population by raising monarchs not recommended? I understand that habitat is important, et cetera, but with the myriad of hurdles that they face, doesn't captive rearing from wild populations help? Sure, they're, they're a really interesting point. And we actually did a webinar on that very topic for the Monarch Joint Venture a couple of weeks ago, and it'll be posted soon. Um, there are risks to rearing. so. There, if you rear a few, um, you're going to learn a lot. And if you report what you find from your rearing monarchs to citizen science pro projects, you'll kind of lead to the body of knowledge about monarchs. And you'll connect to monarchs in a really good way. 
So I, I don't want to say rearing is bad, but the, the monarchs, even if somebody's rearing hundreds of monarchs, um, which I don't recommend, I'm going to say why in a second, that's, that's not going to make a dent. Um, we are talking millions of monarchs. And what I like to say is we just can't rear ourselves out of this problem. So the habitat is really important. So we're not going to make a big difference by rearing. And there are lots of risks to rearing. And here I'm going to separate it into somebody going out and collecting every monarch egg or caterpillar that they see and bringing it into their house. That's, that's kind of one thing. Somebody could bring in a few, that's another thing. Or there are um, commercial operations that, that produce monarchs commercially and sell them. So the problems with rearing a lot in your home or producing them commercially, it, there are many problems with that. One is disease. So monarchs are normally um, reared or they grow up under very uncrowded conditions. So when you bring a lot of them together, it's really easy to transmit diseases. Another problem with rearing them, with rearing large numbers is there's some brand new research coming out showing that monarchs that are reared inside not exposed to natural conditions don't behave normally when they get outside. And most of this research has focused on migration, but that there are some potential risks with rearing situations, and we're still working out the details on that. And another problem is, that there's two more I'm going to mention briefly, and this has to do with the mass rearing and commercial production is monarchs are sometimes released in areas where they shouldn't be, um, either at a time or a place that they wouldn't naturally be. And that means that it's not good for the monarchs that get released under those conditions. But it also can cause problems if we're trying to understand monarchs. For instance, if we see a monarch and we aren't sure if it was released or if it got there naturally, we really need to understand the population well to save it. So anything that messes up our ability to do that makes it harder for us to, to understand what we need to do to help monarchs. Um, this is especially a problem I'm concerned about in the West where monarch numbers are really low right now. And there are many people trying to understand what's, what's going on with monarch populations. And they need to know that when they see a monarch, them. So lots of risks and, but, you know, I don't want to say don't ever rear monarchs because there are so many benefits to rearing them. I just think that we shouldn't think that we're saving monarchs by rearing them. We are saving a few lives of monarchs. You know, when we bring them in, there's a lot of mortality out there. I'm raising them. Here's my little monarch that I was going to show you. I'm raising a monarch right now. So, you know, I'm not saying don't do it, but I'm saying maybe don't raise every single one that you see. That was a long drawn out answer and I wanna move on, but if somebody has questions about that, um, feel free to email me. You can just email info at mlmp.org and I can send you a lot of resources on that. There's, there's a lot of, of good information out there. In the end, it's a decision everyone has to make for themselves. Um, okay. I'm going to move on now, Brad, and we can save other questions later. And I'm going to switch. And um, OK, so now we're going to switch gears. And sorry to kind of cut those questions off, but I really want to talk about the MLMP Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. Um, started in 1996 at the University of Minnesota in my lab. It was a graduate student project that has gone on now. This is its 25th year, I believe. Um, but it's just been a, a really great way for us to learn about monarchs. And now the monarch lab isn't at the University of Minnesota anymore, so we're jointly running this with the Arboretum and the joint venture. So here we go, talking about the Monarch Larva Monitoring Project. So I'm gonna kind of give you a brief overview and then dig into the nuts and bolts here. So first of all, to do this project, you need a site. You need a place that has milkweed in it. it can be a garden, a park, a roadside, a prairie, your backyard, your neighbor's backyard. 
The only requirement is that there's milkweed and that you have permission to monitor it. You shouldn't go somewhere you don't have permission. So make sure you're safe. You need to describe the site to us because we learn a lot from characteristics of the site. So how big the sites are, where they're located, what kind of milkweed grows there. So that's information that we get once a year. So when you first sign up for the project, you provide background information on your site and then you monitor. So this can happen weekly and you can see here that there's a lot of different possibilities of things you can do. I'm only going to really focus on estimating monarch densities today, but I'll show you how to get information on all the other ones. And you can also send us what are called non-site reports so that if you're doing this at your house or you just aren't doing it at your house and you see some monarchs and you want to tell us about them, you can report something from a site that is not monitored weekly. So we call those non-site reports. So many, many different options and you can pick and choose between these. And I just love this picture over on the side here. These are two little kids kind of pointing out the kids are good at monitoring milkweed because sometimes they're just at eye level with the milkweed. So that works out really well. We don't recommend the kids do this on their own, but it's a great thing to do with kids. And you can tell from these little boys that they can be pretty little. My kids started doing this when they were three. Okay, the scope of the project. We have over a thousand sites that have been monitored and many volunteers have multiple sites. And we started in 1977, well, 70 or 96 at our lab and then 97 with other sites outside. And so you can see the spatial scale. We cover the Eastern population really well. We have some volunteers, but not as many in the West. We have a lot of Canadian volunteers and some volunteers in Mexico. So here are concentrations. And you can always tell like we have a trainer, Luz Gehring, in Denver, so we get little pockets. We have a lot around the Twin Cities because we were there for a long time, a lot around Madison, um, a lot around Kalamazoo where somebody has done a lot of training, Ilsa Gebhardt. So this is this is where we have people kind of doing training, but we need, we need people all over. And I'm gonna take a little time to talk through here because this is kind of the meat of what we learn from the MLMP, this, um, monarch density. So we call this activity one weekly monarch density and all of these graphs that I'm going to show you now have been downloaded from the results link on our website. And just look for a second to kind of explain what's going on in these graphs. These are what are called stack bar graphs and it's like a regular bar graph. These are showing you a proportion. So we're showing monarchs per milkweed plant. And the different colors in these stack bars refer to different stages in the monarch life cycle. So the blue, as you can see here, refers to eggs. And the first instars up through the fifth instars, we're gonna learn about those in a second, show the monarch caterpillars getting progressively older. So that's what this means. And for instance, this bar right here that I'm toggling over that was July 21st last year, about 40%, so four out of every 10 plants that people looked at that week had eggs on them, and then successively fewer first, second, third, fourth, and fifth in star caterpillars. So that's how you read this graph. And one of the first things you see on here is that there are a lot more eggs. And that's, I'm sure, what motivated the question, the really good question that somebody asked about Maybe we should just be bringing in all of these eggs to raise them because there is a lot of natural mortality out there in the wild. So you can see a lot more eggs. Um, a lot of those eggs don't turn into caterpillars because there are a lot of predators out there eating them. So one of the things we can learn from this is what is the survival from one stage to the next stage. So we see it's very low from eggs to caterpillars. Another thing we can see, and I'm gonna take away those circles and just look at this graph a little more deeply, is we can see, and let's look at the 2019 one again, we can see when the monarchs came back. So this is a sum of all of the sites that were monitored in Wisconsin last year, 2019. So there are 38 different sites represented here. On average at these sites, people were not every site, but the sum at those 38 sites, they were looking at about 1400 plants. 
So you can see when people went out on May 12th, they didn't see any eggs. They found some in the week of May 19th. So these are eggs laid by the monarchs that are coming back from the south. Most of them get here by the beginning of June. Then those adults, they've had a long life. They start dying off. They start stop laying eggs. So we get a decline in numbers. So this is no more eggs being laid or fewer eggs being laid by the migrants from the south. And then these guys that were eggs back here start hatching out as adults and we get a big increase in numbers and then a decline. So we usually see two peaks in the upper Midwest. And that's the, the first generation laying eggs coming back from the south and a combination of the second and third generations right here. So this is kind of overlapping generations going on right here. And then they usually taper off. Now, this is kind of a normal year. 2019 was a normal year. 2012 was a really interesting year. Um, if you look, the y-axis in these two graphs is different. This one is more than, it represents more than twice as many monarchs. It goes up to two. This goes up to 0.8. So 2012 was a really weird year. This happened all over the upper Midwest. And people who studied any kind of insect or even plants noticed it was a really early spring. They came back really early. They had huge numbers. I've never seen so many monarchs up here as we saw in 2012. And then the population crashed. So this was a really interesting year. And there are a lot of things that went on. It, it got really warm and then it got cold again. It was, it was just a, a weird year and weird years usually aren't very good for organisms. So sometimes we get this, a big peak and then a crash of the population. And this happened all over the upper Midwest. And then you might be wondering, we had the question from New York. So this is what we're seeing this year. And this is just in Wisconsin. I just pulled the data from Wisconsin here. Um, we have a lot of people that aren't reporting yet. It only represents 14 sites. But look at the y-axis here. This is only going up to 0.1, where last year went up to 0.8. So our peak this year is about a third of what it was last year. So what you observed in New York is exactly what we're seeing in, in Wisconsin. I'm sorry to report bad news, but the numbers are not very good. So that means we really need to understand what's going on this year. Um, it's not as fun to go out and not see any monarchs, but it's, it's important for us to understand what's going on. So numbers are not great this year. If you're noticing that, you're right. Okay. Let's move on here. So a couple other things we've learned. Um, it's Texas. So Texas is a long ways from Wisconsin. Um, there are some of you from Texas, so welcome everyone from Texas and thank you for the contributions you made to the data in this chart. So one of the things that's so interesting about Texas is there are monarchs there basically all year. So we can tell what's going on with the monarch population. Let's start in March. So these numbers are all piled on top of each other, but this is March right here. These eggs right here are laid by the monarchs coming back from Mexico. So in, in Wisconsin, we're getting the monarchs coming back from the south. We're getting the babies of these monarchs that are eggs right here. High peak as the monarchs move through, move through Texas and then just keep moving north. So pretty low numbers, but some throughout the summertime. They're not gone during the summer and they're finding patches of cool places along rivers or in people's gardens where they're watering milkweed. So some do stay in Texas. Then we get this little peak in August. This is really common to get this peak in August. There's a few monarchs that move down from the north early. We call it sometimes the pre-migration migration. So these monarchs are moving down, laying some eggs. So we get this little bump this bump, we think, is monarchs that are moving the big sweep of the migration coming down and for some reason um, being pulled out of their migratory state and laying eggs in Mexico or in Texas. So I'm going to give you a new term right here, and that's diapause. It's spelled D-I-A pause, diapause. Most of the monarchs that are migrating south in the fall are in what's called reproductive diapause. They don't mate and lay eggs until next spring, but some of them do, and that's where these eggs come from. These are the monarchs moving down. We call it breaking diapause and laying eggs. 
And then we see that they're, they continue and we see eggs in through December and into January. So they're staying there and breeding all winter long. And that's something that people are really trying to understand and study more now. So that's what we can learn by collecting data. So I'm not gonna go into a lot of details that we've learned a ton from this, but I just wanna kind of take a bird's eye view right here and talk about what are the benefits of these data that people are collecting for us. So we can quantify changes in abundance and range. And I've just shown you some examples. We can quantify year to year variation and variation in different locations. Because people tell us information about their habitat, they tell us if it was a field like this on the bottom, there's a lot of milkweed, or if the milkweed is more sparsely distributed like the graph on the top, or like the picture on the top, we learn about habitat requirements and then the impacts of environmental changes. So what happens in hot years? What happens in cold years? We can use that to make informed management decisions and we can publish the data. So I'm really excited that um, the methods of the MLMP and the data from this project have been used in right now 27 different scientific publications, which is more than any other Monarch Citizen Science project. So we really are using the data that people contribute. There's also all sorts of amazing human capital benefits. And just by being involved in monitoring monarchs or monitoring any of the other organisms that all of you have experience with. I had a student named Eva Lewandowski, who's now the citizen science coordinator for the Wisconsin DNR. And she was interested in the impacts on people of being engaged in these kinds of projects. And we learned that people do show increased concern about nature and habitat because they're learning so much by doing this. And that they engage in a lot of other conservation actions like talking to people or preserving their own land or using fewer pesticides or advocating for changes. So we know that people that do these citizen science projects engage in a lot of really great behaviors that are good for monarchs and the rest of the natural world is gen in general. So lots and lots of benefits. Okay, you're gonna have time to ask questions um, pretty soon, but now we're going to hopefully now, at this point you should feel like you know more about monarchs from the first part and that you're convinced that it's a good thing to monitor monarchs. So now we're gonna get into the nuts and bolts of how you do that. So this might look daunting. I'm gonna show you a bunch of screenshots of the different activities of the MLMP. It looks like a long list, but they're optional. You can see that most of them are optional, except we really do want you to describe your site to us, and we hope that you can measure milkweed density on your site, but everything else you can pick and choose from. I'm going to spend the most time talking about measuring monarch density, and that's the activity that gives us the graphs, like the ones that I just showed you. And we'll talk just very briefly with a few slides about estimating monarch survival and this one will be especially interesting for those of you who like that really great question about rearing monarchs, because this one you do need to bring monarchs inside and rear them. So I'm hoping that if you do that, which I do, as you can see right here, um, if you do that, that you do report your findings to us. So that's where we're going. But first I'm gonna tell you what you need to know for success. So everything I'm going to say is on the website. Um, the website is at monarchjointventure.org slash MLMP. So you can be writing that down while I'm talking here. So we have a really well website. It's just newly designed. I'm very excited about it. And lots and lots of information there. All right, so you need to know where that website is. You need to be, here are the skills you need. You need to be pretty good at keeping records. And we don't have an in the field app. Um, we worked on that for a while, but it's actually kind of hard with a complex database like this. So right now you collect your data in the field and input the data later on, on online. 
you need to recognize milkweed. Now, this is important. There are some things that look a little bit like milkweed, and I'm not going to show pictures of this, but one thing you should recognize is dogbane. Um, dogbane is in the same family as milkweed. It didn't used to be, but they got lumped together. So um, you want to make sure that you're looking at milkweed when you do this project. And I really recommend some great handouts that were made by the Xerces Society on its milkweed guides. So if you just do a search for Xerces, and it just spells X-E-R-C-E-S, milkweed guides, there are regional guides because you're from all over the place. I'm not going to tell you one is better than the other. You should look up for your region and you'll find out about milkweed. Um, but here, just to kind of remind you, and I have been interested in milkweed for a long, long time. And this milkweed right here in the upper right, this is my new favorite. Um, this is Asclepius amplexicollis. It's called clasping milkweed. You can kind of see how the leaves clasp. And I just found this plant for the first time in the Arboretum last Saturday, a week ago today. And I've only seen it one other time in the wild. So I'm very excited about that plant. Um, and then you need to know how to identify monarch life stages. And that is coming in a couple minutes. So basically, that's what you need to be able to do. You need a site. And we would prefer that you your site has at least 10 plants, 10 or more plants. Um, it's fine if you monitor fewer than that, but you're going to get a better sense of what's going on with the population if you have 10 or more plants. So your site can be anything from a big field um, with not very much milkweed in it, where you have to kind of search far and wide. So this person right up here, um, it can be an area where milkweed is really concentrated. These are my parents out here. Um, at a site in Wisconsin. This is somebody's backyard. So here's a backyard milkweed patch. So there are many, many different sites, roadsides, anything, nature centers. And then some materials are helpful. Um, once you get better at it, you maybe don't need as many of the materials, but you'll need the data sheets. You can either bring them into the field or I actually just bring a little piece of paper and then transfer it onto data sheets at home, but whatever you like. Um, a hand lens is helpful when you're learning to distinguish the eggs from other things on the milkweed. So here's a little hand lens. Um, we have this book of, or this set of cards that show pictures of the life stages. This is a little monitoring kit right here that will be available soon. I, I saw in the Monarch Joint Venture Store that it's not available now, but I'm sure it's coming soon. With a little guide to other things you see on milkweed. So lots of, of helpful things in our monitoring kit. Okay, so now we're going to move on before the question after this and teach you how to identify eggs and larval instars. So we're going to have a few more quizzes coming up here. All right, so here we have, this is the same picture that you've been seeing on the side of your screen here. So that can kind of give you hints. Here we have the five larval instars. An instar is the stage between shedding the skin or molting. So the egg hatches, here's a little egg up here, that's the size of a pinhead for scale. The egg hatches and becomes a first instar. So the little first instar comes out of the egg and um, hatches and eats. It's the first instar for a couple days. Then it becomes a second, it sheds its skin, becomes a second instar couple days, third instar, a couple days, fourth instar, a couple days, and then the big fifth instar. And during this period, which can last anywhere from nine to 12 days, the caterpillar gains 2,000 times its mass. Okay, so imagine that. If you're a woman who's had a baby, think of your seven pound baby and multiply that by 2,000 times in 10 days you would have a really big baby, a 14,000 pound baby. So that's how quickly monarch caterpillars grow. And they do that because all they do is eat. Okay, so we're gonna start with the eggs. So the eggs, so you can, you can be fooled with eggs. And one of the biggest foolers for eggs is what we call latex dollops. So milkweed gets its name from the milky latex and the leaves. And this great picture right here, this right, there right in front of this person's thumbnail 
is a latex dollop. And this is an egg right there, latex egg. They're hard to tell apart. They can be the same size. So a couple clues, the latex dollops are almost always on a vein. It's where the vein got bumped and the milkweed, the latex leaked out. That's one thing. It also is round where the egg is pointed on the top. So I purposefully left this slide small because this is the way it looks to you when you see it. But this thing, the egg sticks up a little bit so it doesn't just make this round globe like the latex can. Sometimes after the latex has been there a while, it gets flat. So here's an egg. You can see that it's sticking up from the plant right here. That's what you would see on the bottom of a milkweed leaf. And then this egg is a close up. So you can really see if you have your, you can't see this with your eyes unless they're really good. You have your hand lens with you in the field. You can see these, these patterns, these kind of stripings on the eggshell. And you can see that kind of pointy top. So that's how you find an egg. Size of a pinhead, pointy and striped. Well, not striped, but it has ridges. Okay, now we're gonna go through the larval instars. Okay, the first instar is pretty easy. The first instar is the only one that has a black head. So if you see a caterpillar with a black head, first instar, this one just hatched out of that egg. See this, the ridges on that egg, it's eating it. That's what it does first. And here's one that has not eaten any milkweed yet, so it doesn't have any stripes. It's kind of this translucent, the creamy color. Some people call it green. It doesn't look green to me, but you know, all of our eyes are different. So, and you don't see these tentacles. If you look over here on my background slide, you can see tentacles. These are super hard to see unless you have your hand lens. And when they're eating, they make these holes. Sometimes they'll make a hole that looks a little bit like a half moon, sometimes kind of a window painting effect. So what they're doing, this caterpillar, you can tell it's been eating because it's getting stripes. Here it has stripes on it. Um, but so that's still a first instar, but it, it has this typical eating pattern. Um, so the small holes on the leaves. So that's the first instar. Okay, here's the second instar. The second instar can be not that much bigger than a first but the head has yellow stripes on it. So here we're getting these yellow stripes on the head of the caterpillar. With the naked eye, you can just barely see these tentacles in the front. So it's always the longer tentacles are in the front of the caterpillar, right here. They're small, but they're visible. And they always have yellow and black stripes where the first instars sometimes don't. And they still make small holes on the leaves. But the clue here, is a stripe on the head and the teeny tiny tentacles in the front. So I'm gonna use the word tentacle. Um, these are not antennae. They look like antennae and they function like antennae, but they're not true antennae. Some people call them filaments or tubercules. I call them tentacles. You can... All right, here's a third instar. Um, the third instars can get to be about an inch long. So they're getting bigger here. The head still has these yellow stripes on it. And what my clue for the third instar is if you took those tentacles and imagine in your mind's eye folding them forward, they would reach the front of the head. Somebody last year told me she imagines them folding crossways and they would reach each other. That's kind of a neat way to think of it too. But I think going forward, if they would reach the front of the head, it's a third instar and you can see them on the back. Um, and here you can see this one um, makes a bigger chew hole. So and they often chew from the edge of the leaves, starting with the third instar, where the first and second usually chew holes in the middle of the leaf. So there's another clue for you. The fourth instar, so it's most difficult for me to tell the fourth and the fifth apart. So I'm going to give you a few clues here. It's still the yellow stripes on the head. And here we can tell this isn't a third because if we bent these tentacles forward, they would reach past the front of the head. And they're about half a centimeter long. So if you're if you don't have super fat hands, your little finger is about a centimeter wide. So you can look at your little finger. That's approximately mine is about a centimeter wide. So the third or the fourth instar has ten, those front tentacles are about half of the width of my little finger. But if you have fat hands, you'll have to think of something else for that. Maybe a pen would be a good thing. Um, okay, fifth instar. 
So these tentacles are the longest. They are a centimeter. So they're about the size of your little finger long. And sometimes they look a little droopy. They, this one doesn't, but every once in a while they do. Um, the tentacles on the back would still kind of reach the back if you folded them backwards. Another thing, if you're seeing it eating like this one, and I don't have the top of this picture, but um, the, they notch the leaf petiole. So what this caterpillar has done is chewed a hole, chewed a break in the leaf petiole. It hasn't cut, dropped it off. So the leaf is still attached to the stem, but it's bent over. And what it's doing is stopping the flow of latex into that leaf. So the caterpillar doesn't have to worry about getting its mouth parts gummed up with latex if it, when it's chewing. So that's a clue. The fourth instars sometimes do that, but not very often. So that's a good clue, but I go by the size of the tentacles. All right, so now we're gonna have a little quiz for you. And we're gonna take about 20 seconds. So you should see this poll up here and tell us what instar you think this one is. So I'm gonna sing Mary had a little lamb like I'm washing my hands for COVID. Um, and we'll give you about 20 seconds and I'll just shut up so you can think. What do you think, Susan? Should we close it now? Sure. Okay. All right. So we can see the answers. Yeah, it takes a minute for the um, responses to tabulate. Okay. Do I hope I close my poll? Three, anyway. two, one. Okay, here we go. Oh, wow, interesting. So um, most of you got it right. This is a fourth instar. A few said third instar, and that's this is kind of a deceiving picture. Um, so that that's a pretty good answer. And a few of you said fifth instar. So good, everyone was, we, we most people said fourth, and we had some that said third and some that said fifth. So the way to think about this one is, and it's, it's a lot harder when you're seeing a picture and you can't tell if these tentacles are, are really long, but this, you'll, you'll get used to seeing this. So these tentacles stick out, they stick out like twice as far as the top of the head, but it was a, if it was a fifth, those tentacles would look longer, but that's a hard thing to tell apart. And it's not a third, go past the front of the head. Another way to think, like the woman told me last year, imagine if my arms are the tentacles, if I folded them over toward each other, a third would reach like this, so they'd kind of reach each other. But this one, if I folded them, they would stick out on the other side. I don't know if you can see my arms here. But so this is a fourth because they would go beyond that. The ones in the back would pretty much reach each other. So it's kind of interesting that in from one inside to the next, the um, like if you imagine a third, the back tentacles of the fourth are about the size of the front tentacles of the third. So that's kind of a fun thing. So here are the back tentacles. All right, here we have another one for you. All right, I think we have enough answers, Susan.
Oh, Susan, you're muted. Okay, here we go. I actually cannot turn on, I cannot unmute myself when the results are tabulating. Oh, that's so interesting. So it does take about 15 seconds for the mute results to tabulate after I close it. Okay, huh. we're learning every, every minute here. <laughs> All right, well, everyone who answered this got it right. So that's great. Um, that's a fifth. And we kind of went over and hopefully you noticed the notching here. So this, this is one of my favorite pictures of a caterpillar in the world. Um, but this, you can see how this has been notched and th that caterpillar chewed that and it's holding on. It didn't break the leaf off and it's chewing. This is a swamp milkweed um, plant, Asclepias incarnata. So it's chewing on here, not worrying about latex coming out, but you can see these these would go way past. If we bent these forward, they would go way past the end of the head. So that's the fifth insect. Good job, everybody. All right, here's a little bit of a hard one. Okay, we have three of them in here. So what, what instar is circled here? Okay, I went through Mary had a little lamb twice. So let's see what people said about this one. I can tell, there we go. Okay. So this is great. We had um, the the biggest answer was second, and the second biggest answer was first. So this is a hard one. And I'm going to talk about all three of these together because you're going to guess all of them. But your clue here is the blackhead. A blackhead. Only the first have a blackhead. So that's good. But but we're gonna talk about size here in a second. So now I'm gonna switch down. So now we'll open the poll on this one, number four. They're tabulating. Okay. Okay, good. Um, the, the most frequent answer was second. Um, that's right. And a few people said third. So let's look at this one and see why it's not a third. We can see these front tentacles, but it's the third inside where if you bent the tentacles forward, they would reach the front of the head. Okay, so look at those front tentacles. You can, you can see them, they're there, but they wouldn't reach the front of the head. And they're just little nubbins on the back of the caterpillar. Okay, so you can guess what your next one is. So we're gonna go to the last one and then we'll talk about all three of these together. So what do you think this one is?
And we're tabulating. Okay. All right, very good. Um, I probably should have had this one go first here because we've kind of gotten the clues, but 100% of you who answered the question answered this one correctly. So that's great. And let me just use this slide to talk about why size isn't a good distinguishing characteristic. And you'll notice that I only mentioned size for the third instar, but size is a tough one. So we'll leave this one circled. This is the first that just hatched out of the egg it doesn't have any stripes yet, so it hasn't eaten any milkweed yet. And we can tell it's a first insar because it's got the black head. Um, these are hard to find. So when you're searching on a plant, looking for this first insar, you have to imagine a pinhead. It just hatched out of an egg that was the size of a pin, pinhead, and it hasn't eaten very much yet, so it's going to be very tiny. So you're looking for this tiny thing with big black head, Looks like its head is a little oversized for its body. It doesn't always have the stripes yet until it's eaten. So this is the hardest one to find, the first instar. Now look at this. Here the, here's the first instar that just hatched. This is the first instar just getting ready to molt into a second. So look at it's much closer in size to the second. This is a pretty new second. It's small. This is a big first instar, but when a first instar molts, it becomes a second and it's still, it has, before it eats, it hasn't gotten any bigger. So this is why I just want to emphasize size is not the biggest thing you use because you can't tell these apart by size. So you remember the head, head is black on the first instar. It's got the stripes on the second instar and the first instar with your naked eye, you can't see these little um, tentacles right here. They're there, but you really can't see them. The second has the stripes and you can see those tentacles. So these guys are the most common caterpillars you'll find because of all the mortality out there. You're going to find mostly when you find a caterpillar, it's usually going to be a first and second. And this slide really tells you um, what you need to know to tell those apart. Um, so just look at the head and they, they'll, that'll give you the clue right away. Now, a couple other things before we get into questions here. Sometimes you'll see caterpillars in the wild that are molting. So they're in the process of shedding their skin. They do this a lot, so the odds are you're gonna see it. So the one on the left here is a third instar. If I bent those tentacles down, they would go to the front of the head. But if you look closely at that, it looks like its head is coming off. And that's what's happening. This is called the head capsule. So this is the skin. This is head skin, the skin on the head of the third instar, that breaks off and it kind of hangs there on the front of the caterpillar for a while. And within a few hours after this picture was taken, the rest of the skin comes out. It basically crawls out of the skin. So it's this caterpillar in a few hours is going to be a fourth, but now it's a third. And if you see this head, this black head ready to come off, that's what's going on there. And you might see, so this one down here on the bottom is a newly molted third, and we can tell this, there's its skin. It just crawled its way out of that skin. It's very small. It would be the size of a second. It would look like a second in size, but these front tentacles are longer. So if we bent these forward, they would reach the front of the head. So that's a newly molted third, and try to avoid touching them right after they molt because their um, exoskeleton isn't hardened yet. It'd be very soft and they're really vulnerable. And within minutes, this caterpillar is going to turn around and eat that newly shed skin. Okay, we're gonna take another break for questions here. Um, this is kind of a exciting thing for me because I don't see your questions as they're coming up. So Brad can ask whatever questions we have. All right, we have a, uh, a few questions that have come in that um, Katie Lynn um, didn't get to, although Katie's been hard at work 
answering lots of questions as they come in. Uh, here's one. Um, radio frequency radiation produced by cell cellular frequencies like smart meters, satellites, etc., may have negative effects on wildlife. Uh, is anyone studying these effects on monarchs? That's a great question. I love questions that I don't know the answer to. So that one, I don't know the answer to. Um, we can look that one up, but I, as far as I know, and I think I know most of the monarch research that's going on, I don't know of anyone who's studying that. All right. Uh, another question, is it true that milkweed beetles can coexist with larvae on the plant? Great question. Yes. Um, milkweed beetles, there are multiple kinds of beetles that eat milkweed. There's one called the swamp milkweed beetle that looks kind of like a giant ladybug. Um, and milkweed longhorn beetles, which are longer skinny, they're in the longhorn beetle family. They have long antennae sticking out. And yet, both coexist. Um, they are competitors, they're eating the same thing. So if there are a lot of weed beetles of either species on the plant, it can make the plant less um, nutritious for the monarch caterpillar, um, but they, they can certainly coexist. Um, yeah, you'll see a lot of different things on milkweed plants with monarchs and other things eating it. Okay. Another question, not so much about monarch biology or MLMP specifically, but about your research travels. Um, how often have you traveled to Mexico for research and do you feel safe doing so? That is a um, and feel free, whoever asked this question to email me because I, I would have a lot to say about it, but I'll be here. I have traveled to Mexico. I first went to Mexico in the winter of 96, 97 which um, when you look at those graphs of the monarch population in Mexico, the first year I was there was the peak, the very, very high year. And I was also there the very low year. So I've seen those changes. So that was the first year I went there. And I, for a long time, I did go most winters. I was doing a lot of research there. Um, went almost every winter I did not go this year. Um, I. I don't do as much research there. Now I more work on conservation work and meet with colleagues in Mexico, um, mostly associated with the Monarch Butterfly Fund and, and just other colleagues in Mexico are, who are working on conservation. Um, but I do go to the overwintering sites. Um, I always feel safe and I, um, I, I have never felt unsafe. I, I've always been with colleagues in Mexico with colleagues from Mexico when I'm there. Um, but I think that, um, you know, a lot of people live there. They're obviously like even in cities in the United States, there are, there is crime and, and it, it is dangerous, but I, there have never been cases where tourists have been in danger as far as I know. I feel safe and I love it. Great, thanks, Karen. Um, one more question. We've had a lot of questions come in that Keelan has answered about um, specifically see, seeing or not seeing monarchs and larvae in certain parts of the country. And we were wondering if you could just kind of speak in, in general about why folks may or may not be seeing uh, monarchs in the area, both this year and just in, in general, uh, other years. Yeah. So um that, that there are a lot of nuances to that question it, it's an excellent question so we do know that in some years some regions of the country are are more productive than others so some years we see a lot of monarchs on the east coast but not as many in the midwest and from what we can discern from a lot of modeling studies that those differences are caused by differences in weather so um, if, if you have kind of a monarchs, well, let's imagine monarchs coming out of Mexico. So we're all, the number of monarchs that come out of Mexico will always affect the numbers that we see. Um, it's, that's, that's kind of the beginning of the population. And then what drives it after that, so we've got that starting number of monarchs every year. What drives it after that is weather, um, how they can survive 
um, how long they, so can the caterpillars survive the weather? Um, the temperature conditions affect the length of life of the adults, so how many eggs they can lay. Um, if there's a lot of rain, the, the adults fly when it's raining, so they can't lay as many eggs. And the other driver is the amount of habitat that's available. And what I like to imagine is a female monarch just flying over the landscape. And if there's a lot of habitat available, she's not going to have to fly as long between laying every egg. It's gonna take her less time to lay every egg if there's more habitat. So we've got weather, we've got habitat, and we've got beginning numbers. And the beginning numbers will be the same for everywhere, but the weather might be different in different places. So if we have good conditions in the Northeast and bad conditions in the upper Midwest, relatively speaking, the, mid, the, upper, the, the Northeast will produce more monarchs than the Midwest. As far as we know, they don't search out those areas, like they don't know in their head, whoa, it's better in Maine this year, let's go to Maine instead of Minnesota. But the monarchs that do end up in Maine end up laying more eggs just because conditions are better. So it's often driven by weather. Um, but if you're seeing fewer monarchs in an area, like if you're remembering 20 years ago and comparing what you're seeing now to 20 years ago, there's less habitat around. So there are all these different factors that lead into that. Um, it's, not, it's not an easy question to answer, and there's a lot of research, a lot of people now that we have data from all these citizen science projects, a lot of people are trying to tease out um, kind of the big picture population impacts and the local impacts. And there's some great research, and I'd be happy to send some papers if people contact me about that. You're thinking like a scientist, whoever answered that question. We should maybe move on, Brad. We're, we are right on schedule right now. Is that okay, or did you have anything else to ask? Oh, Brad, you're muted. Oh, yeah. Yes, let's let's move on. Now that, that was the last question for you from, from my... Okay. okay, great. Okay, so now we've kind of, we've taught you about monarchs. We've taught you how great citizen science is um, and a little bit about the skills you need to know. Now we're going to dig into the nuts and bolts. So we're going to focus on activity one, collecting data for egg and larval density. So the first thing you do when you go out into the field is you record basic monitoring event details like the date and the temperature and the time. So we have this picture of many kinds of smartphones. All this information is now available on your smartphone. Um, you can bring a thermometer. Our monitoring kit includes a thermometer um, if your smartphone doesn't tell you that or, or you want to get it really local. So those are the things you get. And let's see where, there we go. And then you monitor as many milkweed plants as possible. So there are a couple ways to think about doing this. If you have a garden with 20 plants in it, just monitor all of them. So you could monitor all of them in an area. But if you're walking out into a field at a state natural area in Wisconsin um, called Rocky Run Oak Savanna, that's where this picture was taken. Um, I could never have, well, you know, I could, but it would take me days to monitor all the milkweed in this field. So then what you want to do is select the plants randomly. So you can pick a transect to walk and walk along and maybe monitor all the plants within um, a meter of you on both sides or anything you choose. The trick is you don't want to walk from good looking plant to good looking plant because you want a representation of what's going on with the milkweed in that area. And the directions in the data sheets give you clear suggestions on how you can pick plants randomly. And then what you do is you walk through this field. So imagine yourself walk, walk, walk through this field, looking at the milkweed plants that you encounter along the way, but not saying, whoa, this one looks really good. Let's go over and monitor that. That wouldn't be fair. And you especially can't do it if you're walking along and you see a fifth instar right there. Um, that would that would artificially inflate the number of caterpillars. You could go collect that fifth instar and raise it, but you couldn't count it if you've decided that this is your transect. Okay, so you wanna pick randomly. 
And then you keep track of the plants and the eggs and caterpillars that you see on them. And then you note, if you see any adult monarchs, it's the place on the data sheet for that. So here's some adult monarchs. I would say three adult monarchs right here. Blooming plants, I'd say here is a Joe Pye weed blooming. Any disturbances, like maybe you were monitoring this roadside and last week somebody came along from the town board and mowed all your plants down, that would be a disturbance. So you would note that. And then we are at, we're keeping track of this um, invasive aphid. It's called, it's called the oleander aphid. It's from Europe and it eats oleander in Europe. I once saw it in Italy and it was so cool to see it on oleander. Um, but here it eats milkweed. So um, it's called aphis nerii or oleander aphid. And you can't mistake it. It's the only one out there that's school bus yellow. It's just bright, bright yellow. Um, so that's this aphid. And it just says, did you see it? And it's fine if you didn't, if you didn't notice, you can just say, I didn't look. Okay, and then you have this data sheet. So I sent you a handout, a big PDF file. This is page 17 in your handout. And this is what you would take into the field. So the first thing you do is make sure to write down all this information on the top. And be sh we put a separate space for the year because you just don't know how many data sheets we get that don't have a year. And then we look at them and they're no good. Um, then you write your name. And where you monitor, the name of the site I monitor is called the Visitor Center at the Arboretum, your city and state. And then you say what milkweed species you're monitoring. We monitor common, the date you go out, and when you start and stop, and the temperature. So that's the top stuff. And you could just bring this on a clipboard or you can copy this information and put it on the back of an envelope or something, depending on what you wanna bring into the field. So always write all that information down. Then you keep a record of every single plant that you look at. So what I've done here, we've, we've got space for milkweed plants that don't have any monarchs on them, that have one monarch, two monarchs, three monarchs, four monarchs, and every once in a while you'll find more than four. Most of the plants you look at will have no monarchs. So you put a little tick mark. So I was walking through that field. Imagine me walking through that field. We just saw a picture of, I looked at five plants, five tick marks here, didn't see any monarchs on them. So I put tick marks. So, so far I've seen five plants, to zero monarchs. Then I go a little farther. I see five more plants and then I find an egg. So I do a little happy dance, um, found an egg on a milkweed plant. There's just one of them. So I put an E there. We have a code up here for you to use. So here's the egg, you saw a, a plant that had an egg on it. So, so far I've looked at 11 plants, 10 of them had nothing and one of them had this egg on it. Then you keep going, maybe you really reach a patch where a female was laying a lot of eggs and you see three more with none. And then you see two more that have an egg. So here's one with an egg, another one with an egg on a first instar. And then you found a really great plant that had an egg and a first instar on it. And I'm going to quit here because it was actually kind of hard for me to make these tick marks on my screen. So, so I looked at 18 plants. So now I'm summarizing down here. I looked at 18 plants, 13 of them had nothing. Three of them had an egg, one egg, one of them had one first, and one of them had an egg and a first. So I saw a total of four eggs these three in that one. And I saw a total of two firsts. And then I saw an adult female and I wrote down all the plants that were blooming at my site. So that's done. So now I'm done with the data sheet and I'm gonna go inside. So again, this is page 17 in your handout and it's on the website. All right, and I'm so excited to enter my data. I go right inside to enter the data. I click on the data portal. So this is the website. Right at the top, there's data portal. I click on the data portal. And then I get to this where it says enter data or view results. I'm gonna enter data. So I click here. And then I log in. So here's my login. Um, you can have your computer remember you since I'm really bad at remembering passwords. I could not tell you what those eight dots represent. If you've never done it before, you register as a new user. If you forget your password or your username, 
will tell you. You can click on those and get it back from us. So you log in. And then if this is your first time, you add a new site and it'll ask you some information about your site, but I've already got this site set up. So here's my visitor center site and it's 2020. So I select the year. And then these are all the things I could do. Um, we ask for a yearly site update. I've done that already. It tells me when the milkweed emerged. Um, I haven't done milkweed density yet. I can click if people are helping me. So three people monitor this site. So their names are in here. And then we're going to um, do activity one. So measuring monarch density. So we're gonna click on there because that's what we just did. That we have data for measuring monarch density. So we click on that and this comes up. All right, so what you're seeing here is these are all the other dates we've monitored at the visitor center this year. So I see these and I can change them. If I push view, I can edit them, but I wanna add a new record. So we click on add a new record. And then we fill in that top stop. Right away, this screen comes up, so it's very straightforward and logical. You fill in the top stuff. It's all the stuff from the top of your data sheet, the date, the temperature, start and stop time. Did you see blooming plants? If you didn't write them down, maybe you were in a hurry, you didn't record them. If you click yes, you get to list them. Did you see aphis nearii? Yes, no, didn't look. It's fine if you didn't look. And then, okay, here's my data sheet. So what I do now is I get myself a little organized. And I say, okay, I saw 18 plants, 13 of them had no monarchs, three of them had one egg, one plant had a first instar, and one plant had an egg and a first instar. So I just write down all the kinds of things I saw out there. Like how many just had an egg? How many just had a first? How many had both? So I saw four kinds of plants. And then I, you can actually choose if you just scroll down in that screen, you can just enter summary data. Um, but I'm gonna show you how to enter individual plant data because I know what was on every individual plant because I use that data sheet. Okay, here's my reminder. I saw 18 plants. And first we're gonna enter the information about these 13 plants with no monarchs. So they were all common milkweed, Asclepias syriaca, did I see any monarch eggs or larvae on them? No. So I click no. And then it says how many total plants exactly like this one? Okay, 13 plants with no monarchs. Same species, same number of eggs. So I say 13. I save that and add another plant. And then I'm going to enter the three plants that have one egg on them. Okay. Here's my three plants with one egg. So I say, what species is this milkweed? It's common milkweed. Did you see any monarch eggs or larvae? Yes. So I click yes, and then this comes up. And how many eggs were on each of these plants? One, okay? This is 13 plants, or excuse me, three plants with one egg. So one egg, and I saw three, I think I click on that. Yeah, there's my one egg on these three plants. So this is the characteristics of these plants. Okay, if you ever forget, um, you can ask us, info at, but it's, it's really straightforward. So I'm not gonna go through all these, but I would just do this for the four kinds of plants that I saw. Some with zero, some with an egg, some with a first instar, and some with an egg and a first instar. So you just need that data sheet make this organized list and it's super straightforward. And then when you're done, if you wanna add another plant, which I need to at this point, when you're done, you click again, and then you just get a check. Now, when Pam, Laura, Martha, and I really did go out this week, we looked at 272 plants, not just 18. Um, so here's our 272 plants, and we saw four plants with an egg, one plant with a second, and two plants with a fourth. So we just check, just go back and check and make sure you did everything right. If you didn't, it's easy to change it. So this asks you to check your data. And then you get to see your graph. 
So right away, you can click on results and you can go to your site. So I do this every time, it never gets old. Um, it's always really fun to see your data. So here are the data from our visitor center site. And you can see this is just our site. On average, we've looked at 178 plants per week. The first two weeks, we didn't see any. The next week, we saw eggs on about 0.045. So that's, it means for every 100 plants we looked at this week, we saw four eggs. That's very low numbers, but we got that information. Then we started seeing first in SARS the next week. We saw more eggs in first in stars um, the week of the eighth, and this is what I entered yesterday. So here's our fourth in stars, the gray on that bar. So it's fun to see that. If you're at a nature center or something, you can keep printing that off to show visitors um, or just, just look for your own pleasure. Okay, so I'm gonna talk very briefly. Um, we're gonna end here in about five minutes and we're right on track um, about activity three. And I'm doing this because I know a lot of you probably like to rear monarchs and it's fine. We, we hope that you would provide us the data from that because we're really learning a lot from people rearing their monarchs inside. So you can collect monarch eggs and larvae. And if you collect fourth and fifth in stars, so the biggest ones, it's not going to affect your density data. Because if you go out one week and collect your fourth and fifth instars, next week they would already be pupae. So it's okay to pull them in. It's not gonna affect your data. If you wanna collect younger ones, you just tell us that you're doing that and we use your data sl slightly differently. We wouldn't use your data to measure survival. So it's fine if you wanna do that. Don't feel like you're breaking the rules. Um, you just tell us that you're doing it and we use your data differently unless you're just collecting fourth and fifth end stars. So please do if you wanna do it and then tell us what happens. You rear them inside. So here's a setup. This um, is a woman named Ilsa Gebhardt who's an MLMP volunteer in um, Michigan. And here she's rearing them separately in containers. She keeps track, she's got a little piece of paper taped on them. And she's worked out that it works best for her to use a cloth on glass jars held on with a rubber band. She's doing this for decades and it works really well. She has very high survival. This is what I do. This is my little caterpillar right here um, on the kitchen table. So what we did in the Monarch Lab at Minnesota, we just bought thousands and thousands of um, these little deli containers. This is the size of a pint. And then you can see on this picture, um, dots here where we've poked holes. We use the probe to poke these holes, but if you're home and you don't have a probe, you can just use a fork. Um, that works really well. So here's the um, here's the setup that, that I use, but whatever works for you. It works best to rear them individually. It's easier to keep track of them. And then you record the outcome on your activity three data sheet. So here's that. This is page 21 in the handout that I emailed to you. Again, you fill in all this top stuff. So here's this caterpillar. Um, it's the first one I'm rearing this year. Usually we rear them in the visitor center, but we're closed now because of the virus. So um, this is just in my kitchen. Um, the larval ID number, it's my first one of the year. I collected it on Tuesday this week. It was a fourth in star. So I don't know what's gonna happen. I hope that it becomes an adult monarch if it does, it'll come out um, sometime around the end of June. I might sample it for OE and there are directions. I'm not gonna talk about that now, but describes that in this handout. Um, I might sample it for OE and it wasn't infected. Or it might not turn into a monarch. It might have some tachinid flies come out of it. Um, hope that doesn't happen, but it might. So here we have, I wrote down here, I'm looking into the future here. Maybe I get some tachinid flies, maybe three little maggots come out of it and it might happen on 629. So you could just keep records of all the monarchs you rear and it's very easy to enter them on the data sheet. So if you rear monarchs, you can just do this. You don't have to do activity one. You can just tell us information about your site and keep track of the monarchs you rear and we would learn a ton. Some of the things we've learned from this, um, we've learned because people are now sending us their tachinid flies, 
So far, we've found seven different cicanid fly species that parasitize monarchs. So if you're raising a monarch and you get this kind of white string coming out of either the caterpillar, see this white string coming out of this caterpillar, the maggot kind of drops down to the ground on that. It can come out of the pupa or the caterpillar or sometimes when the caterpillar is just pupating. Um, this, this one is fine. It comes out, it looks like a house fly. This one is called Lespezia archibohora, but there are many other species. They don't have common names um, that separate them. Another thing we've learned about is this wasp. Um, this is called Teramalis casotis. Again, it doesn't have a common name. These little wasps right here, this is the male and the one on top is a female. These are smaller than fruit flies. And this is inside a monarch pupa. And we've had MLMP volunteers that are um, that are finding these in the wild. So it's gruesome. You're not happy when you find these. But to understand what's going on with the populations, we need to understand these natural sources of mortality. And for the most part, the tachinid flies are not invasive. There is one one species that was introduced, but the others are here. They're just predators of monarchs. Um, so, lots and lots of background. We covered a lot. We often do these MLMP trainings in a whole day, but we're doing this in two hours. We're almost done right here. So, I'm just going to end by showing you where to get more information. So, again, um, go to the getting started, uh, go to the website, monarchjointventure.org slash MLMP. If you click on getting started, Everything I told you and much more is here. And one of the things I just want to point out is one of the choices under getting started is MLMP online training. This was some of our lab members a few years ago. Here you can see she's holding the data sheet in her hand. And we have a whole list of videos right underneath that. These are very short. They're anywhere from three to five minutes long that will tell you this information if you ever need a review. So it's people from the Monarch Lab talking you through all of these steps. So what we've covered today, we've given some background on monarch biology and conservation basics. Um, we've taught you how to identify monarch eggs and larvae. We haven't talked much about host plants, nectar plants, pupae and adults. We haven't talked very much about migration and overwintering. Um, giving you some background on the project, looked at my, my measuring monarch density and doing rearing. So we've just skimmed the surface, but there's a lot of great information there um, on really short, easy to watch videos. So I want to end just by saying that your data from the MLMP project will help us understand and conserve monarchs. We have learned so much from volunteers in this project. And we'll, we continue to learn um, as the population fluctuates. Um, I want to once again put in this plug for monitoring even when you're not finding monarchs. It's not as fun, but it helps us understand what drives the bad years. So we can learn a lot more when we have data from good years and from bad years. So just, just that little encouragement to go out and monitor, um, even if the weather isn't great. Um, and I want to um, acknowledge all the people who took, um, if people aren't a part of our old lab or volunteers who submitted the pictures, um, they were acknowledged on the pictures, but um, thanks to everyone. And now I see that Brad isn't here, so I think Katie Lynn will be ask, asking the questions and um, we can move on to the last section of questions. So thanks all for listening. Yes, um, so I also lost track of which questions I was sending to Brad, but I will do my best to remember which ones there are. Um, first, Karen, would you be able to talk a little bit about um, the MLMP and the Field Museum and how we're working together with them? Sure, so the project, um, the MLMP protocols have been adapted for a lot of different purposes. So I didn't talk at all about the Integrated Monarch Monitoring Project or IMMP. That takes uh, um, protocols from the MLMP and other programs to um, give an even more detailed picture of monarch habitat and 
monarch um, distribution and abundance. So parts of that are based on the on the monarch larva monitoring project. Um, and that's another kind of taking it a step further. Um, the field museum work that we're doing is looking at um, how monarchs use urban areas. So basically using um, using the protocol, but adapted specifically for urban areas. So we work with people at the field museum who have expanded and are looking in detail about the contributions that urban areas make to monarch populations. And Katie Lynn, you might have more to add to that if you wanted. Yeah, I, I know that our database manager has been working with the field museum to, oh, Brad's back, <laughs> um, has been working with the field museum to um, make sure that the fields that the field museum are collecting with their program are matching up correctly with the fields for MLMP. So we are working together with, with the field museum to um, get to more people and um, get data that are, are useful for everyone. And then Karen, do you want to speak similarly to Project Monarch Health? And MLMP and how those two projects. Sure. So I mentioned Project Monarch Health just very briefly when I talked about. Um, I showed it in the slide with the big five. So it's one of the big five projects, and I didn't have time to go into that, but I'm glad we got this question. So Project Monarch Health is a project that looks at a parasite of monarchs. It's a protozoan parasite called Ophriocystis electroscira and or OE for short, and you don't have to remember that name, but OE. And on the directions for our activity three, which is somewhere around 20, page 21 in that handout that I sent you, um, if you do rear monarchs, we would ask you to take samples of those monarchs. Um, you can just stick a piece of tape on the abdomen of the monarch and, and put that on a piece of paper and send that to Project Monarch Health to see if the monarch is infected with this other, this other parasite. So it's a, it doesn't usually kill the monarchs, but it, it has negative impacts on them. So that's another citizen science project. And we work closely with them. Um, the director of that program was actually a student in the Monarch Lab back in the 90s. She was actually influential in starting the MLMP, Sonia Altheiser. So um, we, we encourage our volunteers to do that project and they encourage their volunteers to do the MLMP. We're all one big happy family. We all get along very well. <laughs> um, I think that was actually all the questions. I was able to answer most of the questions that were in there and those that I haven't um, we already talked about so okay oh, actually nope there's one sorry <laughs> if you're monitoring transects within a large area like a prairie should the same transect be uh, walked each week or is that not important that's a really great question um it is not important you can monitor the same transect every week but if you're choosing a transect randomly you can um, monitor a, a different transect. So we have people doing it always. In some cases, it just is easier to monitor the same transect. It might, it might be along a path through your area and you might not want to go off the path. There, it might be you don't go into a wet area. So it's fine to do that or it's fine to take a different transect. We even have people who for reasons of convenience just select her they don't even do a, a transect, they just monitor an area of their site every week, like a corner of it that's easiest to get to. So you can do it any way. The, the big thing you want to avoid is choosing a plant to monitor because it looks good or not choosing it because it looks bad. So whatever your rules are for making the decision, once you make that rule, like if you pick your transect, you should stay on that transect and not go off it because you see a plant that looks extra good. So however you choose the area to monitor is fine as long as you don't do it based on the quality of the milkweed. 
Or if you see a big fat juicy fifth in star off to your right, that's not within your transect path. You right. have to for that week. <laughs> right. So that's hard. hard to do. It is. Yeah. Even for those of us who have been monitoring for years. <laughs> yep. So you can note that it was there. So there's a note section. So even if you don't run across a fit, if you see one and you don't you don't monitor that plant. You can note that you saw it and we'll know that there were fifth instars and you can bring it into rear it for activity 3. So you can do that. So I want to just thank you. We're exactly at time right now. Um, thank you for everyone that was here and a special thanks to our panel, Susan and Brad and Katie Lynn. Um, this was definitely a team effort um, and thanks to everyone for being patient with us. Um, we will be sending you an evaluation and since we're just learning how to do these webinars um, we'd love your feedback so we'll be sending you an evaluation um, a link to an evaluation in that you'll have information on accessing a recording of this and also any um, answers to questions that we didn't get to and i just want to say that um, please feel free to contact me um, I'm the person behind info at mlmp.org. I love hearing from people for further details or anything that we didn't get to in this really short webinar. Um, I really appreciate your interest in monarchs. Um, they've been my whole professional life. I've been focusing on monarchs and hopefully you can tell that I really love them. Um, and I hope that you decide to monitor monarchs based on this, but um, welcome. If you're not already in the monarch family, welcome to it. And we look forward to working with you. Thank you.